um, it, it is pretty incredible what can be accomplished when we're in a um, shelter in place and quarantine through through Zoom. Um, we've been having um, uh, we at, at Crossroads we we have uh, uh, had a prayer room for a number of years at Crossroads, and there's prayer morning, noon, and night in the prayer room. And um, well, when that was scrubbed. Uh, we just did our prayer room online, and we've had Zoom prayer meetings now for five weeks, uh, morning, noon, and night. And um, people from all over the country who would never have been in our prayer room in Texas have been joining in the prayer room. Um, and so that's that's exciting how God, I, I, I love what was just prayed by my brother Ken, that, that there's no hindrance to the Holy Spirit's working. And so praise the Lord for that. So. Um, so again, I'm honored to share, and, and what I'm going to share uh, briefly is is something that's been uh, revolutionary in my own personal life and my corporate life as a church, as a pastor in the same church for over 20 years, and uh, that is that is this you know biblical revelation of the power of of corporate prayer. Um, there's there's plenty in the Word on 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 private individual prayer, but there's just as much or more on corporate prayer. And so I'm going to just, you know, I thought if anybody in the chat wanted to throw a couple of passages that I give up on the chat for people to see, that would be awesome as well. They don't have to, but um, when you, when you read through the, the Old Testament, um, there's a form of prayer that's mentioned predominantly over all other forms of prayer. And in the Old Testament, um, the most mentioned form of prayer is described literally as a cry for help. That's, that's the form of prayer, is it's a cry for help. The, the best uh, summary of, of that is Psalm 107. Um, Psalm 107 is like a short history of Israel's prayer life, literally, uh, a short history. And in Psalm 107, verse 6, it actually gives you that form of prayer that's predominant in the Old Testament. It just says this in Psalm 107, verse 6, then they cried out, plural, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. And that word cried out is literally to shriek. So this was a uh, audible, corporate, sort of desperate uh, kind of, of praying. And, and that's what you find when you read through the Old Testament is that the Israel's corporate life of prayer was most often birthed out of crisis, uh, trouble, trials, calamity. Uh, I, I tell our folks down here at Crossroads that crisis awakens cries. And um, I think that's probably true right now in our situation as it is. Um, we're praying for a dear brother in New York right now who's, who's on a ventilator with COVID and, and um, in New York City. And crisis births, awakens cries. Um, but but what I, the reason why I brought this up is that um, Israel's corporate memory, when you, when you read through it, is that something would happen when they would cry out, though. Something actually took place when they would, in their trouble or their distress, they would cry out. Uh, God would, would suddenly draw near. Um, he would come close to them, you know, like a, like a mom or dad would rush to, to a child when a child is crying. Um, God would respond to Israel's corporate cries that way. Um, a summary verse is Deuteronomy 4, 7. It, it basically summarizes how Israel got through the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, which that was a huge crisis in Israel's life. And it just says this in Deuteronomy 4, 7. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? The way the Lord, and listen to this, the Lord, our God is near us whenever we pray to him. And that word pray is that word cry or call out to him. Literally the word in the Hebrew for call or cry is to accost, like literally to accost someone, to grab a hold of them. And, and so if you listen to that Deuteronomy 4, 7, that was their summary of how they made it through. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we call out to him. And so 
we've all experienced this. We all know this. We've felt this many times in our lives that when we would lift our voice, even if it was not audibly, but just in our hearts, this desperate cry, we would sense God's nearness or God would come near to us. He would draw near. And that's, that's sort of the mantra of the Old Testament. Desperate prayer equals divine presence. That was their revelation in the Old Testament. Desperate prayer, divine presence. Um, uh, when my son got leukemia, um, uh, many years ago, uh, I, I, this passage, this reality of God drawing near was so real to me and my wife, just when we would cry out we, in those, those dark seasons of our son's leukemia, which you thank God he's 20 now and made it through all of that. But just the feeling of God's nearness, whenever we would cry out, even when we felt like, this, you know, even the demonic presence of the enemy in those moments. So, um, so just a little summary, um, when you look at the, at the Old Testament form of prayer, crying out or calling out for help, their revelation was that God would be near them. And most often when you read the Old Testament, they didn't pray to get stuff from God. That wasn't the mo motivation for their praying. They, they prayed to get God. <laughs> it wasn't to get stuff from him, but it was to secure or restore um, divine presence. Um, there's a Hebrew word, and you find it a lot in Exodus, but this Hebrew word is shakan, S-H-A-K-N, and it's, it's the, the Hebrew word for, the, I mean, the Hebrew word shakan literally means for God to dwell or to tabernacle. Um, it was associated with the tent of meeting, and that word shakan, you can find it at like the last couple verses of Exodus 29, verse 13, I think it is, but it, it may be 30, I, I forget, but it's the last few verses of 29. Um, P.F. Brzee, our founding Nazarene, and the early Nazarenes like seized on that Hebrew word. It was later like sort of added some vowels to it by uh, rabbis, and it became the word Shekinah from Shekan. And the early Nazarenes um, spoke often about the desperate need for holiness wasn't a doctrine, but it was the presence. If we were going to sustain the doctrine of holiness, we had to have the manifest presence of the Holy God. No holiness without Holy Spirit. We know that. Doctrine isn't enough. And so um, this was why they prayed. They prayed to restore the Shekinah, for God to shekan, to dwell in the midst of them. And, you know, whenever they would see God in that fiery cloud in the tent, the words that would come out of their mouths was the word glory. And so that's how we, we put those two words together, Shekinah glory. It's the, it's this, it's, 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 it's not just God doing stuff for us. It's God's presence so real and tangible in the midst of us that it's, there's a tabernacle, there's a, a sense of glory, of weightiness, of heaviness, of realness that you can't be talked out of. It's um, <clears throat> atheists, even in the context of a glory cloud, would doubt their atheism. You know, uh, this is <clears throat> the the power of his presence. So one one major epic story that's meant so much to me is when Israel is now faced with the loss of God's glory, his Shekinah. Um, because of their sinfulness, uh, Moses presses into that tent for a 40 day prayer meeting. And, um, you remember his cry, right? His cry was, was show us your glory. Show, show me that don't, don't, we can't survive on your angel. You know, we, 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 an American church can't survive any longer on just an angel. Um, uh, programs, strategies, plans. We we have to have the, the manifest glory of, of, of God. And so um, I want to pause for a minute before we sort of transition to some, some Jesus uh, gospel stuff. But um, the reason why this passage means so much to me is because about 20 years ago, um, I, I was just out of seminary and um, uh, we were in a serious crisis at our church. It, it was my first church. It's been my only church. Um, when I got there, there was three families left, um, as, as, uh, Ken described, uh, well, my dad was my DS. And so he offered me his best church, you know, uh, a, a good opportunity. Um, uh, it, it was actually a, a church he was closing. So there was no nepotism for my, my DS dad to, 
to offer me this church that he was about to close. Um, and, and when I got there, it was in a terrible crisis. Uh, the community, um, it was like, like was de described, it was predominantly African, it is predominantly African American, low income, um, a, a, a lot of, uh, gang and drug activity all around our, our, our church. And for three years, um, I tried to turn this, this, uh, church around, um, trying many strategies, programs, plans uh, that work, but they weren't working where um, I pastored. And about three years in, um, we, everything we tried to do to reach people just seemed to fail. And I knew we were in trouble. And I knew also that something was missing in all of my efforts. We tried so much to reach into the apartments, low-income housing, and just street ministries and all that kind of thing and food and clothing and all of that um something was terribly missing and a, a friend of mine invited me um in a time about three years in that i was i was 29 years of age and i was like man i think i think i failed as a pastor and um maybe i should go back to school for business or law or something i was really contemplating leaving the ministry um questioning my call like you know maybe it was my dad's call just sort of thrust upon me sort of thing and um, this friend invited me to New York City uh, to attend the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And I, I went to uh, a Tuesday night prayer meeting. And I just got to tell you that, um, I guess in the Midwest, I'm not sure how it is out east. There's not many prayer meetings out here, um, Wednesday night prayer meetings. Growing up, I, I, you know, on Wednesday night, the youth were in another department. So I never really saw uh, corporate prayer, really. Uh, in the churches where I grew up. And, um, and so, you know, I was invited to go to this, this church and I was told by this friend, you need to go to the prayer meeting. And I didn't understand why I would need to go to the prayer meeting, but I went and I was, like I said, I was so discouraged. I even told the guy and I hate, and I regret that I said this, but I said, uh, prayer meeting, what, what can God do in a prayer meeting? And that's, that's literally what I said. I was just so depressed and so discouraged and ready to quit. And so I went in there and, um, this whole, stuff I just shared about the, the manifest presence of God, the glory, the Shekinah. I walked into a bunch of people crying out to God, like just corporately crying out. And I felt that weight that's described in the Old Testament of God's manifest presence just so heavy on me. And I mean, it just felt like, I mean, I could just tangibly sense and experience the, the presence of God. And I, I mean, I was overwhelmed and I, I, I don't think I'd actually cried. Um, in about three years, I, I just lost my tears and instantly there was just tears were shed. And I, 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 I found myself repenting of things that God was showing me. It's amazing when you get in the glory of God, the manifest presence, how things are revealed in your life. And so, I mean, deep doubts, unbelief, fear, um, just all kinds of stuff. And, and so in the middle of that, that incredible uh, encounter with God that I had, um, I, I heard the Lord whisper to me, you've tried many plans, many programs, many strategies, go home and pray and I'll come. That's, that's pretty much what I heard. I, I heard the Lord say, you haven't tried to pray. You haven't tried prayer. Go home and cry out to me and I'll come. And I really know I heard the Lord say, I'll come. Um, and I, I always say this, that I, I feel like that a lot of the stuff that we do is, is horizontal and it's trying to get people to come, but prayer is vertical and it's, it's to get his glory in the midst of us. And I believe if we go vertical, he'll go, he'll go horizontal. He's better at going horizontal in ministry than we are is by his spirit. And so we really didn't have much vertical ministry. We have mostly had horizontal ministry at the time. And, and so on the flight home, God, God quickened Isaiah 58, I think it's verse 9, like God was actually telling me, almost speaking into my spirit in Isaiah 59, if you call to me, the scripture says, I'll answer you. But if you cry for help, I'll say, here I am. And I don't know if you hear the difference there. It still wrecks me even when I, when I, when I hear it, because I heard it 20 plus years ago on the plane coming home from that prayer meeting to a dead church. And he said, if you call to me, I'll answer. But I didn't need an answer. 
the next part of it says, if you cry for help, same Hebrew word, I'll say, here I am. Literally, he promised in that passage to literally not give us an answer, because I didn't need answers, but, but to be tangibly in the midst of me in our church. He said, I'll be there. If you cry out for help, I'll say, here I am. And that's what I needed. That's what I knew our church needed was God to be there and say, here I am. I'm, I'm here. And so um, we, we got home. There was about six people left of leadership in the church. And we um, started meeting on a Tuesday night. Uh, we didn't have prayer meeting at the time. So we just chose Tuesday. I started praying on Tuesday nights just because I wanted to pray on the same night they prayed in New York in Brooklyn. I thought maybe that glory I felt would just sort of flow down into our dead little church in East Fort Worth. And, uh, and so really like that was it. Um, for about six months, we kind of scrubbed everything we were doing and we just started meeting about six of us and we just started crying out. Um, like in a sense, Lord, show us your glory again. We've, we tried all this other stuff, but what's missing is your manifest presence. Lord, may you pour out your spirit on this church. It's, it's dry and dead, God. It's like a valley of dry bones. And in that six months, there was, a, there was repentance. There was brokenness on my part. Um, a lot of times we don't realize that when we're not, man, we're not operating in his kind of glory, we're operating in the arm of flesh. We're doing a lot of stuff in our own strength rather than in his power. And we're doing it out of good motives, but it doesn't produce good fruit. And so um, I found myself repenting of things that are kind of normal church ministry, being a normal pastor stuff and um, prayerlessness, really. And so um, uh, about six months in, uh, I, I went to church and, and I can't describe church. I don't want to describe church at Crossroads uh, before we started praying because it was just such a bad experience every Sunday. Just um, We would have this homeless man come in. And he would sit in the back row, and about the second point of my sermon, he'd always lay over in the back seat and start snoring real loud. And um, uh, it was just horrifying and, and taunting and discouraging. His name was Fred, and I would go back after the sermon and just tell Fred, Fred, you can't sleep in our church. I mean, it was a comfortable pew, mind you, and he hadn't got much sleep. And he would apologize, and then the next week, it would be the same thing. About point two, he would lay over on the pew and start snoring and Finally, I just started having two points. I just wanted to get the sermon done before he would fall over. And, um, you know, uh, people in and, and our, our normal experience was just people with addictions and drug issues and just all kinds of violence, junk in their lives. They would just come and go. Um, just a big mess at Crossroads. Well, about six months in, um, I went up to preach and I felt this this uh, Old Testament <laughs> fire glory of God. I didn't see anything, but I just felt this, this response like God promised in Isaiah 58 verse nine. Here I am. I just felt, I didn't hear him say it, but the glory of God flooded back in our, our, our church. And, and I felt as if the Lord said, here I am. I've, I've heard your cries. I've come. And I, I can't, I mean, this is not a makeup story. I mean, almost instantly we begin to see these evidences of the manifest presence of God. Um, by just really in the midst of us. Um, one Sunday morning, I got up to preach, and I didn't even get the sermon started, and this girl got out of her seat and ran down to the altar, like under heavy conviction, and she just started repenting. I just hear her going, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, God. And um, I, I realized it couldn't have been my sermon that convicted her because I hadn't even started to preach, so I couldn't get any you know points for a good sermon there. Um, she was under conviction because his glory was there. And um, I went down and I heard her asking God to forgive her. And after she was done, I said, sister, what happened to you? And she said, she said, pastor, my name is Stephanie. I'm a stripper and um, I'm not going to strip anymore. And she said, and, and her, her boyfriend had followed her down to the altar and her, and she said, this is my boyfriend. He deals drugs in the neighborhood. He's not going to deal drugs anymore. And, and then she said, and she said, um, we're not going to sleep together either. He looked over and he goes, we're not going to sleep together. It was like he, he wasn't down there for himself. He was down there for, for her. And, and she looked at me and I realized that it was the glory of God that brought conviction of sin, that brought like this desire for holiness. Because she actually said to me, she said, Pastor, what do I do with my stripping clothes? And um, I was thinking about like, okay, um, where did I learn that at Olivet 
or, or Treveka. I, I was trying to remember what pastoral class I, 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 I heard how to deal with someone who asked the question of what I do with my stripping clothes. And um, I literally didn't get any words out. And she just said, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to burn them. And, and instantly I realized that the fire of God was in that place that it was his glory that, that caused that consuming desire in her to be holy. And I got to tell you, the rest of the story on Stephanie is that she's a prison preacher now. She preaches all over Texas and goes into prisons and preaches the gospel. And um, she's a part of prison fellowship. Um, a few weeks later, during our prayer meeting, the, the prayer meeting began to grow and the church began to grow, honestly, with meth heads crack addicts, prostitutes started coming. And I realized it's that whole vertical horizontal. The more we reach up and pull his presence into our midst, the more his hand reaches out. And I'm not saying it's clean. It's not, it's sloppy, it's messy. There's a lot of battles in it, but, but only God can pull these, these broken people in. And so um, I, we were in the prayer meeting. I look back and there was this girl and her, her, um, name is Tina and she's a part of it. She's part of a Latin gang and she was there and we were down on our knees praying up in the front of the prayer meeting. And um, I, I looked back about 15 minutes into our prayer meeting and she was gone. And the enemy came and said, see, this, this praying is disturbing. It scares people. It makes people uncomfortable and all this and that, you know, and just to get us to stop. And the reason why she was gone is because she was under such conviction about what we were praying that she actually fell to her face in between the pews and began to repent of her sins. And so now this tattooed girl is like jumps up out of the, the row and she runs out into the lobby because, you know, just jumping and like that guy in Acts 3. And, you know, we don't jump in the Nazarene church. So I kind of was sort of trying to get to her to calm her down a little bit because she was actually just shouting and praising. And. I grabbed her. She's about twice my size. And I grabbed her arms to kind of keep her from jumping so high. And she grabbed my arms and we were both jumping. She was lifting me off the ground. And, and um, so I, the reason why she was just full of joy because she had she'd been raped and abused and defeated and all that in her life addicted. And all of a sudden she was forgiven. <laughs> she was, she was free of all those chains. And so the very next week she goes and, she brings her, her gang-banging husband, a 300-pound Cadero, uh, Chris Cadero from, from, from L.A., and um, he, he doesn't have what she has. He's, he came to the prayer meeting to confront the pastor. He was mad because she wasn't smoking dope with him anymore, and so he planned to come and confront me. And so we were up there praying, and she, you know, I look back and see them, and he's got this huge scowl on his face, and... Um, uh, he, he, his, his wife, Tina cries out, pastor, look, I brought my husband. And he looks at me with this look, like I'm going to beat you up after prayer. And so I'm, I'm already a little disturbed. And we, I, we just prayed it. I cried out even louder. I think even longer, just hoping that, you know, I'd get a, you know, breakthrough there. Um, I was always looking at that door as an exit strategy, just in case, you know, I got pounded and Literally within about 20 minutes of us praying, I look back and this mean, angry man had his hands in his, his face and his hands and he was just weeping. He was broken. And um, he, he, I, I went back and I, I, I asked him what happened to him. And he said, I, I, I looked up and I said, God, if you're real, take me by the back of the neck. That's the only way he knew how to talk to God. Take, like, just let me, take me by the nap of the neck and just, and he felt something just grip his his back and it just threw sort of a fear of the lord in him and he repented of his sins and and uh chris was delivered that second prayer meeting after his wife was delivered and um, he gave me a hug after that his hug were hurt so i can't imagine what a beating would have would have been from him so just a hug was was painful and 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 that's just examples um of what we began to experience uh, 20 years ago when we began to pray was this, this manifest glory of God. Like I said, um, we would see uh, meth addicts come off the street, crack addicts. One, one lady was driving by to prostitute herself. Her name is Judy. and She drove in to the church instead, and God delivered her from 26-year crack addiction in the presence of God. And I just, we, we place so much emphasis, I, I think, sometimes on what we do that we forget um, how powerful he is and what he alone can do if we will get out of the way and let him.
And so about 10 years later of pretty much making that the foundation of our church, if you call to me, I'll answer. If you cry out for help, I'll say, here I am. Um, what other nation is so great as to have their gods in the way our God is near us whenever we pray? I just lived in that. And um, looked out one day, in two, about 10 years in, and, and every seat was filled with these broken, hurting people in East Fort Worth that, um, that really just needed the manifest glory of God. They didn't need my nice sermons. They needed his presence. And so um, jumping a little forward past the testimony, um, it should not surprise us then, if that is true in the Old Testament, that Jesus' major big movement into the temple that day was, was to redefine the temple activity when he said, as he cleansed it, and that's what I believed, guys, honestly, guys and gals, what I believe that the Holy Spirit is doing right now in this pandemic in the church is he's lovingly, caringly cleansing the church. He's, he's reestablishing um, the, what really is the foundation of our church and churches. Jesus said, you know this, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. He, he pulled the Old Testament revelation of prayer bringing the glory and reestablished that foundation that prayer is the key to presence. And if you look in Matthew 21 at the next verse, the moment that Jesus reestablishes the foundation of corporate prayer, it says this, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them in there. Did you hear that? He healed them in there. There was no healing in there. And, and that's what I think is so troubling the church today is we're, we're being chased by COVID in a sense. There's this, this COVID everywhere. But I just think what a, what a revelation if, if, the, if the world even knew that to flee from COVID, there is healing in God's house of prayer. There is a healing God in the house of prayer. And, and so um, that, that revelation bothers me that the lame and the blind were outside the temple because there was no healing. But the moment that prayer was reestablished, there was healing. And that I can promise you, whenever we establish the primacy of prayer in our lives, our churches, we'll start seeing healing. Because we all know, right, holiness is healing. When we experience true holiness of heart and life, there is a healing that goes with it. I mean, spiritual, emotional, mental. Um, you know, in my in my ministry, we have quite a few mentally ill people. And guys, I, I have to tell you, guys and gals, I can tell you that that man, the presence of Jesus is is a healing presence, even mentally. There's a there's a mental healing in in the in the presence of Jesus, and so. Um, uh, let me, let me close with, uh, just, a uh, focusing your attention um, on the reality that, so Jesus did not just reestablish prayer for, for, for us to see that prayer is the key to the healing presence of God. But, um, one of the things that, that we, we've actually pulled from the gospels practices, we, we do practices at our church from Jesus's teaching on prayer. And um, maybe you can just mark these down. We, we won't have time to go there, but Matthew 18, um, verse 18 and 19 and 20, you know these passages. Um, in 16, Jesus says, I'm giving you the key to unlock heaven. And then he describes binding and loosing. Whatever you bind on earth will, will have been bound, and whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will already be loose in, 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 in heaven. And the context of that is the next verse, where two of you agree. So we know this isn't private prayer. This is corporate prayer. Wherever, whatever, wherever two on earth agree about anything you ask for, my Father will do what you ask. And then the next verse is, and where two or three are gathered, Jesus says, I will be in the midst of you. How many see Shekinah glory there? Where two people agree with what is true in heaven and binding and loosing heaven, he says, there I'll be in the midst of you. And so the promise is, is that when we agree in prayer, um, his presence is actually 
promise, his real here I am presence. And um, so we actually practice that at Crossroads. We practice that in even our Zoom prayer meetings that we're doing each day. Um, all right, let's agree right now in prayer. And, and we'll just, we'll amen what someone else is praying. You don't have to use the words bind and loose, but what we're saying is, God, what is true in heaven, what has already been bound and loose in heaven, we want that reality on earth. Um, I remember in one of our prayer meetings, this, this girl was praying for her husband who, who was an alcoholic. And uh, in that prayer gathering of agreement, um, one of the prayers prayed, God, we bind this addiction off of him. May the next drink he takes, he become violently ill. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you can pray that? And, um, you know, I, I'm truly not making this up. About three or four days later, I get this, this call from this screaming mother, this the screaming lady who was praying, and that the, 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 the lady whose husband is the alcoholic, and she said, Pastor, you won't believe it. Alex is throwing up all over the house. He, he can't keep his alcohol down. And, um, and so we just don't realize the vast authority we have with heaven when we agree with each other in prayer. Um, Mark 11 says that we can say the mountains be moved. With faith believing prayer, it says when we pray, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. And so we actually practice this um, this kind of praying where we just say to those, uh, these obstacles. And they're really in that context, it was the, the religious system. It was the temple that was the obstacle that needed to be moved. And you all know this, right? Most of what's keeping people from God's presence is actually religion. It's, it's, it's a mountain. And so the church, we're supposed to be practicing this kind of praying. God, we say to this mountain, this obstruction that keeps people from your presence, be moved. Um, the third teaching is Luke 11, right? Um, Jesus teaches the kingdom prayer, you know, which is corporate, and then teaches a kingdom parable about the friend that comes knocking at midnight. And he says, now I ask, now I ask, and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock, and that's plural. And the last thing he says is, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so that, that became so formative for us. I mean, most of our people's problems can't be solved by even good counseling, psychology, medication. I mean, they need the Holy Spirit. And, and so the promise in scary promise in Luke 11 is, is that his Holy Spirit is only poured out when we ask, corporately ask. And so every gathering we pray at crossroads, we pray with the laying on of hands, God, fill your people with the Holy Spirit. Um, we, I think we realize this, don't we now? Holiness is an impossibility without the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be holy people. We can't produce holy people. But is it interesting? We put so much more emphasis on holiness preaching and so little emphasis on holiness praying. Holiness praying is what produces holy people. Jesus said, just ask for the Holy Spirit. Um, I was praying one day uh, for a man in agreement with him and he was battling homosexuality. He was battling just uh, pornography issues. He was in just an absolute pitched battle for his life. And, and um, I, I just felt the, this verse rise up in me and I went, I just laid my hand on him and I said, Brady, we're going to pray right now that God would fill you with the Holy spirit because that was, was missing his life. And, and so I, I, I just asked, I saw it, and I knocked, and I just said, Father, fill Brady with the Holy Spirit from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Just fill him with that holy fire. I didn't realize at that moment he was just basically about to leave God. And um, he felt, he said later on, he said, I felt this fire of God just go through me. And he said the desire, this, these deep desires, homosexual desires, were literally removed from my life. Um, I was cleansed of this, this pornography addiction, and I got to do his wedding um, not long after that and see, and now he's, he's moving toward ordination in the Church of the Nazarene. And so here Jesus gives us these, these, these teachings of how to like, operate as a, as a house of prayer. And the final one was John 14. I think we need this more than ever now. In John 14, it just says, um, you'll do greater things than even I did. Um, and he, it's, it's actually John 14, uh, verse 12. He says, he says, if you have faith in me, you'll do what I've been doing. You'll do even greater things because I'm going to the father. And then he says, he explains how we will do greater things. He says, um, I'll do whatever you ask in my name. 
so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And so really even this whole greater things that we desperately need right now can only be activated by um, asking in his name. <laughs> so it's almost as if Jesus has tied our hands and freed our hands in this sense. Um, if we don't pray, this is, I think John Wesley said this, if we don't pray, we can expect nothing from God. <laughs> but if we would become a praying people, we can actually expect greater things from God. And man, I tell you, we need greater things um, in these days. And so in, in just a, a kind of a, a way of activating, um, mark, mark in your spirit, just the contrast, um, Acts 114, the disciples, it just says that they devoted themselves constantly to prayer. I know you know this, right? Acts 114, they devoted themselves constantly to prayer. So they were listening to their teacher. They were following his teachings in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just a few verses later, with just a few people, it says, and then suddenly there was a violent wind from heaven. And our culture wants the suddenlies, even the church culture wants the suddenlies, but we don't want the constantlies. <laughs> says they devoted themselves constantly to prayer. And I just wonder what that would look like in your context during COVID, that we would say, how do we devote ourselves? We, you know, in a sense, we're almost like we're, our, our hands are tied right now as to what we can actually even do. We can't even hug our people. We can't even go visit them in the hospital. I wonder if this would be the season that we could actually become like Old Testament Israelite moving into the tent, New Testament upper room people that we pressed in constantly.